Hello everyone, this is Brad Wistance, and after a hiatus from making videos, I'm finally back with one for you. The prop plane you see on the screen here is not actually the focus of this video, but a little sneak peek of an upcoming one. I figured I'd put it on the front of this video and see if anyone could ponder out what the intent of this little thing is. The focus of this mission will be building a passenger space plane to lathe that can go there and back on a single stage without any refueling or ISRU. The goal wasn't to make it as large as possible, although I did want quite a few passengers. The, the main goal of this was to make it as efficient as possible, and to be able to get to lathe and back with the least amount of tons per passenger. Essentially, it's the Boeing 787 of space planes. The original intent with this little prop plane was to fly it over next to the space plane, which is currently sitting on the runway, and then just walk the pilot out and into the plane. However, as I got closer to the runway, I came up with what I thought was a better idea. Right here, I slowed the plane down by toggling to the propellers and turning off the SES that powers them. You can see that the propellers are still spinning at this point, but this is actually due to the, the air pushing the propellers and not the other way around. Since this landing proved to be rather tricky, I think I'll, uh, I'll stop waffling for a couple seconds so you can enjoy the landing. This really seems to be a convenient, easy, safe, but, but mostly safe method to relieve congestion at our busier airports, and I, I will be recommending it to the National Transportation Safety Board. But in the meantime, it is time to load our pilot out of this craft and into the space plane. And then, of course, time for a, another very safe maneuver where the, uh, the propeller plane was dismounted from the larger space plane. One of the keys in developing a rapier-based space plane is maximizing the amount of mass per engine. This is done through keeping drag low, mostly in this case through minimizing the front and the rear cross section. Through these techniques I was able to get the mass of the craft all the way to 840 tons despite only having 32 rapier engines. This was done by putting 16 rapiers on the back of each MK3 fuselage on the sides and then putting the nuclear engines in the middle uh, in a cargo ramp that concealed them from the air, thereby minimizing drag until I opened the cargo ramp at higher altitude. I probably could have pushed the mass of this craft even higher due to the low drag that it was generating, and I still would have been able to take off and accelerate to Mach 1, but the ascent overall would have become less efficient to the point that I think it would have taken away all the benefit of reducing mass by eliminating engines. All this low altitude performance meant that the takeoff run itself was quite safe, which came as a big disappointment to the Kerbals who really like to live life on the edge. Speaking of Kerbals, there are 480 of them, which comes out to 1.75 tons per Kerbal, which as I mentioned previously is the metric that this mission was designed around. So the KSC said goodbye to the Kerbals, and wished them a good trip to Lathe, and feel permitting a trip back home as well. Like in most of my previous space plane videos, I'm going to use an ascent profile where I accelerate to about 440 meters per second at sea level before starting to climb. This might seem very wasteful in terms of fuel, but with so much mass per engine, it's pretty much impossible to push past the sound barrier without being at sea level and having the maximum thrust from the engines. You could always add more engines, but the reduced performance from having all this added dry mass is going to have more of an impact than the extra feel necessary to accelerate at a lower altitude. Once climbing, the goal is not to climb as quickly as possible, but to find a good middle ground between two competing interests. One is to climb very quickly, to minimize the amount of energy lost to air drag. However, the rapier engines are so much more efficient on air breathing mode compared to closed cycle mode, that it is also paramount that I get very close to the drag limited top speed of the craft. This minimizes the delta V that has to be achieved with the rapiers on closed cycle mode. Because the craft weighs so much, it takes the craft a very long time to get close to this drag limited top speed, and therefore I end up climbing at a very narrow angle to just to give the craft enough time to be able to accelerate close to 1600 meters per second. Once switched to closed cycle mode, I just have the craft maintain a steady angle of attack until about 30 kilometers 
at which point I set the nose to prograde as I now have enough time just to burn directly into an orbit. Setting the nose to prograde while on most of the ascent allows me to lose minimum amount of energy to drag while on the way up. So I've now reached orbit and it's time to plot our next destination. I'm going to use my typical gravity assist route to get to Joule, and my first destination is going to be Eve. Eve makes the ideal first destination because in terms of delta V, it's the closest planet to Kerbin. For efficiency's sake, I've already used all the oxidizer in this build, and we'll be using only the nuclear engines for the orbital maneuvers in the rest of this mission. The ejection to Eve is a total of about 1100 meters per second, and the nuclear engines are only capable of giving the craft about 7 tenths of a meter per second squared. I therefore cannot do the ejection in a single burn, and will be spreading it out over many burns at periapsis. To plan these, I plan when my final ejection burn is going to take place, and then work back from there. Do, since there's about 15 days between the first burn and the final burn, I subtract about 12.3 degrees from the ejection angle of the final burn, and therefore know where and when my first burn has to be. So after completing the final burn, we are now on track to rendezvous with Eve, and conveniently, leaving Kerbin at about two years and 160 days in universal time, allows me to get a rendezvous with Eve, which bounces me right back to a rendezvous with Kerbin. After doing the gravity assists off of Eve, I'm then going to do two gravity assists off of Kerbin to reach Joule. Because I've gone over this route in previous videos, I wanted to use this opportunity to answer a really specific question I received from a viewer. What he asked me is, how come it's useful to do two gravity assists off of Kerbin in a row? Now what gravity assists do is, when entering Kerbin's sphere of influence and leaving Kerbin's sphere of influence, the magnitude of my velocity remains the same. However, the direction of my velocity changes, and it's this angle between entering and leaving that makes the gravity assist work. In theory, it's possible to do a perfect 180 with a gravity assist and eject from the sphere of influence in the exact opposite direction as you entered. However, in practice, this would involve going through the atmosphere and then the lithosphere, and there's just a lot of, uh, lot of air and rocks and molten crust in the way. So in practice, we have to stay, in the case of Kerbin, 70 kilometers away from the surface. Therefore, there's a maximum angle that is really, really can be achieved between where you enter and where you leave the sphere of influence. And in this case, the angle that we need is less than what we can do in a single pass. Therefore, by splitting this gravity assist off over two flybys of Kerbin, we can achieve what we need to achieve. In this way, it's very similar to splitting the ejection burn at Kerbin into multiple burns. To inject into the Julian system, I'm going to use a flyby of Tylo. Tylo is ideal for a gravity assist because, as I discussed previously, the closer you can get to the planet, the better angle you can get with your gravity assist. Because Tylo has no atmosphere and is almost as massive as Kerbin, it's really ideal for this. The alternative method to inject into the Julian system is to do an arrow break in Joule's atmosphere. This does work, especially with the new heating model in KSP. But arrow braking is inherently inaccurate, and it's difficult to predict exactly how much delta V you're going to get by going through the atmosphere. A gravity assist can be calculated with extreme precision, and therefore the orbit that results after my gravity assist off of Tylo puts me on an orbit that has a periapsis that exactly aligns with Lathe's orbit and is precisely flat. It's this accuracy that I really think makes doing a Tylo assist the ideal method to inject into the Julian system. Because of the accuracy of the Tylo capture, I now have a rendezvous with Lathe that gives me a very small relative velocity to Lathe, and I only need to shed about 300 meters per second to give me a captured orbit in Lathe's sphere of influence. It is possible to do an arrow break in Lathe that will lose quite a bit more meters per second, but this involves spinning your craft wildly to spread out the reentry heating over many parts. Since this is a passenger mission, I figured I'd avoid spilled drinks and bad customer reviews and give them a more gentle entry. One question I get asked a lot is how I manage to land at a specific spot on the surface when descending from a suborbital trajectory. And there's no real one simple answer to this. 
It's a combination of knowing your craft, knowing the atmosphere, and then just a question of piloting. Uh, you have the advantage here that you can use your control surfaces to adjust your descent as necessary, and you'll put the nose down if you need to slow down more quickly, put the nose up if you want to stay at a higher altitude and glide for longer. And using that method, you can, you can make almost any landing work once you understand your craft pretty well. So my goal here is to land on this upward facing slope, but I do need to make sure that I can coast up enough of it that my craft will reach a relatively level place. Due to how weak the brakes are in this game, if I don't end up on a level plane, the brakes aren't going to be enough to keep this craft from rolling back down the hill again, which is uh, definitely not something that we want. Luckily, I had just enough momentum to coast up this hill and find a very nice landing spot with a nice uh, oceanfront view. Although, to be fair, Lathe has so much ocean on it that almost any land is an oceanfront view. And uh, if you look carefully in the background, you notice that the uh, the ocean appears to be doing something very funky there. I, I guess that's uh, that's just KSP for you. And uh, Bill did his best Lion King impression here, though he had no baby lion to hold up to complete the effect. At this point, Bill and 15 of the passengers filed out for a photo op. Some of you may ask where the other 464 passengers are. But uh, frankly, there's not enough hours in the day. If you really want to see 480 kerbals out in the surface, uh, you might have to do that one yourself. So since there's no mining, no ISRU in this mission, the plane is immediately ready to head back. I, uh, I guess, suppose I could have given the passengers some more time to play around on the surface, but I suppose I'm a cruel god and I ordered them all back in the plane and we got ready to head back to the Kerbal Space Center. The takeoff run on Lathe proved to be quite a bit more interesting than the one on Kerbin due to the lack of the runway. However, a one of the dunes here proved to be the perfect little place for a bit of a takeoff ramp that launched the plane right into the air. The ascent on Lathe is similar to that on Kerbin in that there needs to be a balance between ascending as quickly as possible and making sure the craft reaches its maximum drag limited top speed on the air breathing engines. However, Lathe is different in that, firstly, the craft is lighter now because fuel has been drained. Gravity is also somewhat weaker on this planet, but most critically, air breathing engines can function to a much higher altitude on Lathe. Therefore, I climb at a much higher angle of attack on Lathe compared to Kerbin. But despite this, I'm able to reach a higher speed with just the air breathing engines. Because of the lower mass and the lower orbital speed, I'm therefore able to get all the way to a stable orbit of Lathe using just the Raper engines on air breathing mode and then the nuclear thrusters to inject into a fully circular orbit. In previous missions, when returning to Kerbin from the Julian system, I simply used a Tylo gravity assist to eject me out of Joule's sphere of influence and all the way back to Kerbin. The disadvantage of this simple route is that you end up with a very high relative velocity to Ker Kerbin, which results in you needing either a rocket burn to inject into a stable orbit or a rather violent aerobraking pass. I wanted to do things a little more efficiently and cleanly this mission, so I've decided to do what is essentially the reverse gravity assist route as what I used to get here. Therefore, I will be ejecting from Tylo back to a rendezvous with Kerbin, but then we'll be continuing on a more extended gravity assist route before doing my final rendezvous with Kerbin. For the gravity assist off of Tylo, I couldn't resist putting my periapsis right above the surface of Tylo to give the passengers a little cheap thrill. I still use the Tylo Assist to put me onto a rendezvous with Kerbin, but I haven't tried to make this rendezvous something that I can actually capture from. Instead, this rendezvous is tuned to put me onto a resonant orbit with Kerbin that gets me a second rendezvous with Kerbin, which then ejects me back to EVE. This assist then puts me onto an orbit of the Sun that will have me approach Kerbin with a relative velocity that's much lower than I would get with just a direct transfer from the Julian system. You'll notice that this is the exact opposite order of gravity assist that I used to get to Joule. 
this is not a mere coincidence as the theory of gravity assists can essentially be reversed to do a route in the opposite direction. While I was using the same gravity assist on the way home, the degree of difficulty, at least in terms of the orbital maneuvers, was much greater. This is because the initial ejection in this set of transfers, that from Joule, involves using that gravity assist from Tylo. This meant that it was very difficult to get the angle of ejection from Joule accurate. This difficulty and accuracy spilled over to each transfer in this route, and I ended up using much more delta V for corrections on the way back than on the way out. However, it still all worked out and I didn't have to use an extreme amount of delta V. When I reached my final rendezvous with Kerbin, I only had to lose about 400 meters per second in the initial aerobraking pass. This number could have been significantly lower, but I needed to approach Kerbin with a significant radial velocity, or face the alternative of having to wait quite a few orbits of the sun to be able to get a direct rendezvous with the planet. I decided that the passengers would be more comfortable with a slightly more significant aero break than having to wait quite a few years in orbit. Since all my followers have hopefully seen me land a space plane before, I'm going to use the final couple minutes of this video to go over a couple other things. It's occurred to me that I have a lot of things up in the air and unfinished at the moment. The Odyssey by Bill series is in the middle of a plot line. The 10 kiloton SSTO still has a couple destinations to go to. And there's a lot of tutorial videos that I've said I want to make and just haven't got around to. All I can say is I have a finite amount of time available to me and making these videos takes way more time and effort than I anticipated when I started making them. However, I really do enjoy making these videos. The positive feedback I've gotten from all of you on each of these videos really makes the time and effort that go into them worthwhile. So, new updates might not come regularly or even frequently, but they will be coming. Additionally, I can tell you I'm working on another video right now, and it's going to be awesome. On the final approach of the runway, we did a close pass of the mountains for the sake of the passenger's enjoyment. And the final approach to the runway is always dramatic enough on its own, so I think I'll be quiet for a minute and just let you guys enjoy it. This brings the 480 passenger unrefueled SSTO mission to Lathe to a close. This has definitely sated my appetite for Lathe for a little while. If you have any ideas for a mission you'd like to see, please let me know in the comments. And as always, thank you very much for watching and stay tuned.